Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Brendan Lussier. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about a model for buying data over time um, and the optimization problems that come with that. Uh, this is joint work with Nicola Morlika uh, and Ian Cash. So this talk is about the demand for data. All right? Now, certainly, there's a huge demand for data in this current world uh, powered by machine learning. Um, increasingly, we can think of data as an important input into the pipeline of product design, right? We have large technology companies that are effectively building up machinery where you throw in data into one end um, and products come out the other. In that world where data becomes such an important part of production, it's important to think about the actual costs of acquiring it, right? And move beyond the idea that more data is better and actually think about like if it's a non-trivial sort of business cost to actually go out and find and acquire and uh, maintain data, we should be thinking about like how to optimize that process. Now that raises a bunch of questions. Um, when I'm thinking about some machine learning task, what's the marginal data, a marginal value of having extra data? Right? How much better do things get if I get a million more samples or take a million samples away? Um, also, as I'm acquiring data over time and actually maintaining my products, do I actually need to be going out and getting new data all the time? Can I just use the data that I collected last month or has it gotten stale and now I need to collect more? And how much money should I actually put toward um, having like collecting my data? And as I set different budgets, how does that actually influence um, the quality of the products that I come up with? So all of this was sort of boils down to a design problem, which is, you know, given that I have a particular use case for data, um, I'm using it for some particular purpose, there's some costs associated with going out and getting that data, and I have some budget constraints. What's the right policy for going out and getting data and deciding how to spend that budget? Um, and in this talk, I'm gonna be focusing on the dynamic aspect of like, how should I spread my budget over time um, in order to, do, to collect data efficiently given that I have some dynamic learning tasks that, that I'm trying to accomplish. So let me start with a motivating example, um, which is a bit of a toy example, but tries to illustrate some of the points. Okay, so let's imagine um, that a politician is running for office and is running ads. And there's an issue that they've decided is a very important issue that they'd like to run ads on, uh, which is healthcare. And we can think of there being a public sentiment about healthcare from unlikely voters, um, which in this very toy example, we're gonna represent as being one dimensional. You know, you spend more on healthcare, you spend less on healthcare. So there's some state of the world, let's call it, say X. Um, and what the politician would like to do is they would like to run an ad that resonates with the public sentiment, right? So they say, some, take some ad, which takes a stance on this issue. And they'd like to get it that, that say that the stance that it takes is represented by some Z. And we'd like that Z and X are close to each other. So the politician is gonna say suffer some loss, which grows quadratically um, in this particular example with the distance between the stance they took and public sentiment. Now, the thing about um, public sentiment is that it can change over time. Right, so even if the politician sort of knew what the public wanted one week, by the next week, things, something might have happened and uh, things might have drifted. You know, so people used to think that you shouldn't spend very much on healthcare. Now suddenly people think that you should spend a lot. In which case they might want to change their ad as well over time uh, to sort of track what the public thinks is a good idea. Now the challenge is that the politician doesn't actually know what the public opinion is they can get access to it by polling. Um, if they poll, then they get noisy samples, right? By calling people up and asking what they think. And so given that the actual sort of aggregate opinion is say X at a certain given time, if they gram samples, they would come from some distribution, which is say maybe normally distributed around X. And so they'd get, you know, maybe they call one person, they get something like Y1, they get another call another person, they get something like Y2. After getting a bunch of samples, they could then aggregate that information into a guess at what X is, and then build their, their, um, their policy in response, their ad in response to that. The thing we wanna capture here is that this polling is not free, right? 
that polling comes at a cost. If I want to set up a polling station, first of all, there's some initial setup cost, right, to actually build up the, the phone banking and so on. And then when I actually go out, I need to pay the pollsters for their time. So I'm going to incur some additional cost per sample. And as a politician, I have some budget that I can set aside for my campaign. And I need to satisfy that budget at least on average, right? So maybe some weeks I could pull more and some weeks I can pull less, but I have an overall average budget that I have to maintain. Now, so what can I do? Um, what are my choice set here? Well, one thing I could do is I could, you know, punt on the whole issue, run a default ad that doesn't really take a stance on healthcare. And then maybe I suffer some fixed loss just from the fact that um, people out in the world are annoyed that I'm not taking a, a stance. Right. Or I could go out and poll right, in order to gain some understanding about what I think is the current state of the world. Then when I do that, I know that the state of the world will drift over time. And an important thing to, to note is that even if the state of the world drifts, the polls that I took in the past are not useless, right? They give me some indication of what's going on, but their usefulness will decrease. They become stale as public opinion sort of drifts further and further than the state it was at when I actually took the polls. And so now the question is, given that, and given my ability to sort of play it safe when I think I'm not, I don't know what really is happening in the world, how much should I pull and how should I organize it across time? Should I pull a certain constant amount slowly over time or should I take specific points and do very aggressive polling and do data drives um, and then sort of free write off of that information until it becomes too stale? So in this talk, um, I'm gonna to try to get at that sort of setup with a very simple and stylized version of a data process, uh, purchasing problem, okay? I'm gonna imagine there's a state of nature, which is one dimensional. We are trying to estimate given access to noisy samples. That state of nature drifts over time and the decision maker gets to choose a schedule of when to buy samples. That schedule can be adaptive, okay? Um, but it's subject to some budget constraints. I'm gonna make a bunch of assumptions um, that are quite simplifying. I'm gonna assume that there's no limit on the amount of data that's available for purchase at any given time. So the only constraint is the budget. I'm gonna assume the quality of the data samples is uniform and known to the purchaser, okay? So think of it as that, you know, you get noisy samples um, correlated with the state of the world and I know how much noise there is. I'm also gonna ignore incentive constraints on the supply side. So I'm gonna imagine that when I go out and get a data sample, it's actually an accurate sample. You might imagine that in particular for this you know, politician polling problem, um, there might be incentive issues where the individuals who are giving me the samples might misrepresent them. I'm gonna ignore that in this talk. And my takeaway um, from this, or the thing that I'm hoping that you'll take away is that even in this very simple setting, the, this design problem is somewhat non-trivial um, and the dynamic aspect of it sort of makes interesting things happen. And so I view this as sort of a, a first cut at what would hopefully be a richer set of models for which we can understand uh, the, the issues at play. Okay, so let me get a little bit more into details. I'm gonna warm up with a static model um, that actually doesn't have any dynamic aspects to it. And then we're gonna add the dynamic part in after. So in this static model, I'm gonna assume there's this hidden state of the world, which is again, this one dimensional thing, it's just a real number. It's drawn from some known prior distribution F. And as an agent, the decision maker can choose one of two actions. They can either guess the state of the world, in which case they suffer a loss that grows quadratically with the distance from the true state, or they can pass. They can take a default option, op option which just gives us a default loss of C. And so I can visualize this. Um, if I take this, the outside option C, then there's basically no guess, right? I get this flat constant payout, right? I get a loss of C. But if I choose to guess, then my loss follows this orange curve, which is the closer that Z gets to X, the lower my cost is. Now, before selecting an action, I'm going to observe samples, right? So as, a, as the uh, uh, agent, as the person making the decision, I don't know what X is. 
but I can learn about X by taking samples, right? And so each sample is going to be the state of the world X plus some mean zero noise drawn independently across samples. And I wanna note that as I take more samples, because my noise is mean zero, I learn more and more about the true state of the world, which means that my loss from taking the guess action goes down. And so what I should imagine is that as a function of the number of samples I'm able to take, it becomes better and better for me to guess. Right? And so sort of the optimal thing to do would be if I have too few samples, I should take the outside option because I'm not very certain about the state of the world. I'm, I'm nervous about suffering a large loss. But as I take more and more samples, my certainty about the state of the world gets better. And so my loss to taking a guess goes down. Let me make this instantiation a little more concrete. Let's assume that this power distribution is Gaussian. And also the noisy samples, right? The noise from the samples is Gaussian as well. And we'll suppose that these Gaussians are uh, mean zero and variance one. Then in this particular case, this very simple, this simple example, we know exactly what the certainty will be after taking a certain number of samples. Okay, so if I took K samples, my posterior belief will be again a Gaussian with some mean that depends on the realization of the, of the samples and a variance that decreases as the number of samples goes up. And actually it's exactly one over one plus K. Once I've taken my samples, then the optimal guess will always just be the mean and the expected loss is precisely the variance. These are properties of Gaussian distributions and it's why Gaussians are particularly nice to work with in this problem. So then we can work out exactly what the optimal policy is as a function of the number of samples. Um, if the number of samples I took is small enough that one over one plus K is less than C, sorry, if the number of samples I took is large enough that one over one plus K is less than C, then guessing is better than passing. And so I should guess, that's this part down here. But if I took too few samples so that one over one plus K is less than C, then I should pass and take the outside option C. And so this is the expected loss as a function of the number of samples and certainly more samples is better. Okay, great. So that was a static version. Um, what we're really interested in is a dynamic version of this game. Okay, in this dynamic version, the state of nature is actually drifting over time. So now we're gonna subscript it by T. And we're gonna say that again, you know, T1, X1 is drawn from this initial prior, but then every round, you know, T increasing um, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, every round the state of the world is subject to an extra noise, which we're again gonna simplify and assume is, is Gaussian um, mean zero variance one, okay? So every round, my state of the world, I take a new Gaussian, I add it to the previous um, state. And so in every round, I can take samples as the decision maker and I get noisy samples correlated with the current state of the world. I can take those samples and then again, I can choose whether to guess or pass given what I've seen from my samples now, but also given the full history of all the samples I've seen in the past. My goal is to man maximize my average long run payoff. And the thing that I wanna note is that the, the samples, when I'm thinking about what to do in time T, the samples that I've ob obtained in the past are not as valuable as samples now, but they're not worthless, right? Because um, the state of the world is drifting over time, but the state of the world in round T is correlated with the state of the world in round T minus one. So learning a lot about the state of the world in T minus one is actually helpful for me in trying to guess what the state of the world is in round T. And so now we could ask a collection policy problem, which is suppose that I have an aggregate budget constraint, right? Where every round I get given some sample, uh, a budget that I could use to go out and collect samples. I could spend that budget immediately to go get my samples, or I could bank it, some or all or part of it, and save it for the future so that I can get more samples later. Then what we'd like to do is to solve a design problem of choosing a policy that tells me how many samples I should collect each round adaptively, given the samples I've, I've taken in the past, in order to minimize my long run expected loss, right? Which is the limit as T grows large of the sort of expected loss that I obtain per round. And this is subject to a budget constraint which is that over the first, you know, say T rounds, I only have the per round budget of B times T to work with. So I'm never allowed to spend more than I'm accumulated in terms of budget up to that point. Um, now I've blocked out the math um, 
of you know, what's actually in this sum. Uh, I'll show it now. It's not important to sort of parse this. Basically, this is precisely what the, you know, the expected average loss is in round T, given all the samples that we've observed up to this point. And I want to note that my, my budget constraint, I want to think of as being in two parts. All right, there's a per sample um, cost, right? So I need to pay a certain amount for every sample I acquire. We'll also optionally allow you know, the problem to have a you know, fixed startup cost as well, where I have to pay a certain amount if I take any amount of samples more than one. And I want to think about that as like the, just the setup cost of putting into place an apparatus by which to get samples um, that round. So how do we solve this problem? How do we come up with a good policy? We're going to use a tool from control theory called Kalman filtering, um, which is which tends to be used in the analysis of, say, um, controlling a robotics. Uh, it's a method of combining a sequence of noisy observations to predict the hidden state, which is itself evolving statically over time, which is exactly the sort of setting that we're looking at right now. Um, so for example, you can use this theory to show that if we took, say, S samples every round, then the variance of my posterior will eventually converge to something like one over square root of the number of samples that we're taking. Again, this is, this is depending on us normalizing so that our Gaussians have variance one. In particular, this variance is actually independent of the observed values. So the actions that we would take, the guesses we would make, like it depend on the actual samples we obtain, but our expected loss is actually independent of the past. And this is a property of Gaussians that's particularly convenient to us. So, okay, that was for a, you know, if I had a particular steady, steady state, right? If I was just taking a uniform sampling of S every round, more generally, we can use this, um, this, this, this feature to sort of analyze what would happen for more general policies. Okay, so we can imagine a state where um, we start with a particular variance and we collect samples at a certain rate. And so blue here is we're going to think of it as the um, as the one over the sampling rate, right? So we have a knob, which is how many samples we're taking per round, which can we can think of as controlling a target point, which is if we just took that number of samples forever, where would we eventually converge to? As we sample our variance, right? So what we know about the state of the world is sort of drifting over time and will always be sort of converging towards this point, which is one over the number of samples. And so for a more general policy, if I'm sort of changing my sampling rate over time, what will happen is that my, my variance will always sort of be drifting towards whatever my current sampling rate is, right? And so we can imagine some policy, which is sort of generally sort of changing the sampling rate and we can track its performance by looking at how the variance would then drift over time, which is a deterministic function of the number of samples that we take. To actually understand the value of that policy, we would compare against a, um, the, the outside option C and recall that the, avail where the option is always available to us to not actually make a guess, which suffers as cost of the variance, and instead take this outside option. And so for any particular policy, uh, sampling policy like this one drawn in blue, the actual loss we would suffer would be whenever the orange line is above the green line, we would choose to, to, to pass and take the green line. Whenever the orange line is below, we would choose to guess and suffer that line. And so then our total expected loss is just the area under this curve that we draw out. It's useful to think about the value in terms of how much we're gaining relative to a very natural benchmark, which is just what we would get with the default policy of just never guess. And so I wanna think about these holes, these holes in white as the extra value we're obtaining um, by taking our samples and doing something with them as opposed to just only taking the outside option every round. Okay, so we want to come up with a good strategy. So let's start with a with a natural benchmark, which would be what would happen if we didn't do anything clever with banking and we just spent the entire budget every round. What that would mean is that we just sample at a constant rate of B data points every time period. Well, this generates a long run average loss, which is just the minimum, like whichever is better of the variance I would get by taking my B samples every round, which is one over root B or C, 
So if one of root B is less, then I'm guessing every round and I'm getting an average long run loss of one of root B. If C is less, then I'm never guessing. Um, and I'm just taking the outside option every round. And my long run average payoff is C. Well, okay. Is uniform sampling optimal? Is this the best thing to do? Well, in general, no. Um, and so in particular, it's pretty clear that if one over root B is higher than C, so if the optimal choice is to just take the outside option every round, then we're spending all this effort getting samples, but we're never actually using them. And that seems pretty suboptimal. And in fact, it is. If you're in this case, then certainly one can do better by say banking, like taking very few samples for a long time, banking up what you've gained, and then taking a short burst of sampling at a very high rate to get you below the outside option, and then repeating. If you did this, you would get some gain over taking the outside option every round. It might be a very small gain, but it is a gain. And so certainly this is better than just always taking the outside option, which is what the uniform strategy did. Okay, fine. Um, but you might ask, all right, well, what about the case where actually when we when the uniform strategy outperforms the outside option, so we're sampling every round and we're actually getting, um, we're actually guessing every round, is that the optimal strategy in that case? Turns out sort of interestingly, no. Um, you could imagine instead of doing that, we have some strategy that's sort of similar to what we did before, where we sample at sort of a low rate, bank up, and then acquire samples at a more aggressive rate af uh, afterwards and repeat. This gives us some amount of payoff, which we could compare against the payoff we would get if we sampled at a uniform rate. And it's ambiguous which one of these is better. It actually depends on which one of these two areas is larger. Um, and in fact, you can construct examples where in fact it's better to do something bursty rather than do something uniform. And so this is sort of our first observation is that even if the uniform sampling strategy outperforms the outside option, it might be strictly better to use a non-uniform sampling strategy, right? Where you actually do these data runs, uh, data drives. And so the insight um, and the thing that sort of generalizes this beyond this particular example is that because there's an outside option available, data, sam data samples aren't necessarily substitutes for each other. There isn't necessarily decreasing marginal returns for data. They're actually complementary up to a point, okay? so. If I know that I'm, I'm sort of out above the, the outside option, um, maybe one sample by itself isn't useful and two samples by themselves aren't useful, but three samples become useful. And so they, they're worth more together than they are apart. Um, and one can leverage that into constructing these examples uh, where it's better to do things in bursts. Okay, so fine. So this uniform strategy isn't necessarily optimal. What are the approximately optimal policies? Well, here are some particular classes of policies to explore. Um, one is what we call an on-off policy, which is similar to the things we've, we've discussed so far. So I want to imagine that I'm going to have a cycle where I have a period T, which is some number of steps. And what we're going to do is we're going to take some fraction of that T steps and we're going to not sample. We're going to start by not sampling for some number of steps. And then at certain, that's, we're going to think of that as being off. And then at a certain point in the period, we turn on, and then we spend all the budget we've saved up from the point we turn on up to the end of the cycle T. So we alternate between no sampling and sampling aggressively, and we set up the, the quantities so that we actually spend all of our budget by the time we get to the end of the period, and we just repeat. So this is an on-off policy. I want to consider a more, an even more a sort of extreme version, which is a lazy policy where we actually only sample in, in rounds where we are worse than um, the outside option. Okay, so I want to imagine a lazy policy is a policy where um, if it's the case that I would prefer to guess than take the outside option, then I do not collect samples that round. So this sort of optimizes the amount that I free ride off of previous samples, which is why we call it a lazy policy. So our first theorem is that these on-off policies are asymptotically optimal as the period length grows large in the case where we don't have these fixed costs for sampling. So remember our, our cost model was there's a cost per sample and then a cost to uh, fixed cost to having any number of samples. If that fixed cost is zero, and so all we have is the cost per sample, 
then on-off policies are approximately are asymptotically optimal, by which we mean that you know in the limit as t grows large, um, the the uh, value obtained approaches the value of, of any other policy. And the proof idea is, is somewhat straightforward. It goes in two steps. Um, first, we imagine you know suppose that there's some region where an optimal policy has its variance above C, which is to say that the, the optimal policy is not guessing in that region. Because the marginal value of getting a sample is only better when the variance is high, it's actually better to sort of not take any samples at all and let the variance grow until the point where we actually want to start guessing again and then take, as many, take, take samples at that point, right? Um, and so actually, if there's a period where we're not going to be guessing, it's better to just be off during that period and not take any samples because any sampling done there is basically a waste. If the variance is below C, then conditional on being better than the outside option, conditional on choosing to guess, in that case, actually the marginal value of samples um, is decreasing the number of samples we take. And so our payoffs are basically convex and it's better, it turns out, um, that it's always optimal to be uniform, conditional on not going outside, um, not choosing the outside option. So in the region where um, we're choosing to guess, it's better to keep a constant rate. Um, so you can show more formally that uh, given any policy, you could reallocate samples to make them more uniform, and this is only helpful. Our next theorem is that you know, more generally, if we allow this, this Z parameter to be bigger than zero, um, so if we do impose a fixed cost to taking samples, then lazy policies are approximately optimal in the sense that they always achieve at least half of the optimal gain relative to a world where um, we just take the outside option every round. And so here's a visual, I, here's the intuition for that proof visually. Consider the optimal policy. Suppose this blue curve is sort of the optimal policy. Um, that what I'm drawing in this blue curve is the variance, you know, so I'm sort of tracking the variance. Now remember that the optimum, like, so the thing we're trying to approximate is the holes, like the difference between the variance of our optimal policy and the outside option curve. We could draw a bunch of squares like this, and the area covered by those squares is an upper bound on this optimal value. Certainly this covers these holes. But we could obtain half of that value by taking a lazy policy, where at every point, if we're sort of starting a new square, we sample as much as we can to sort of get down to the bottom corner. And then we don't sample anymore, which causes the variance to drift up at a constant rate. So, so there's a lazy policy that gets precisely these blue area here which is at least half the area of the squares, which is an upper bound on the value of the optimal policy. So let me sum up. Um, this talk, we introduced this very simple sort of um, model, which exhibits some non-trivial optimization with respect to how to collect data. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it models this particular problem of trying to learn the state of the world with quadratic loss. Um, and we show that even this simple problem, the marginal value of data is not monotone if we have this notion of having an outside option, right? So this, we can think of this as different modes of usage that we're deciding between. And this can lead to a strict preference for collecting data in bursts rather than collecting it uniformly over time. Okay, where to go from here? More generally, we'd love to use this to think about insights and best practices for people who are optimizing their collection of data in more general problems Right, beyond these Gaussian issues, what about like multidimensional regression and, and you know, even like deep learning? Um, what's the marginal value for data and how should we think about collection? Also, we'd love to you know, build out into, um, into, into broader classes of problems with supply constraints. Um, what if there are incentive issues? I think there's a rich space of open problems there uh, to try to understand to what extent these insights carry over um, in more realistic and fleshed out environments. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much.